All right, first question. Uh, Gideon, your character, Sig, is the hero of the story. Tell us a little bit about his journey. Oh, Sig's just a little small town kid. He's just super content in his situation and loves his life, loves his fam, loves his brother, loves his friends, uh, loves the legends of Star Wars past. And uh, he gets swept away on a journey when he accidentally runs across an ancient Jedi temple, which is then revealed that all the stories he knows and loves uh, are are true and he accidentally removes a cornerstone piece that is uh it, it, ooh, that is integral to the structure of the galaxy and it, upon removing it it shuffles up and he finds himself on the journey to try to reverse its effects as well as becoming a jedi knight and uh Gaten and marseille how did you approach voicing your characters and finding their personas yeah i think um what I felt very fortunate about is that uh, Dan and Benji wrote down a pretty uh, incredibly developed guy to initially jump into. There was like any questions I had, they had answers. And that was really, really refreshing and really easy. But also they were very adamant about making sure that it felt um, spontaneous and they let me fill in uh, the blanks. I, I felt comfortable making suggestions and asking about line reads and little uh, interjections. And I'm such a Star Wars fan along with Sig specifically that I felt comfortable enough to like put my own little references in every now and again, uh, just for fun. There's most of these are for sure not even going to make the cut, but um, being able to just have fun and it was so free and exciting and it did not take long for it to feel like home. And uh, I think that's where the love of the show comes in. I think it's where the love of the character and everything he loves like feels real is because there's so much love around this project. There's so like everybody who's a part of it is so honored to be doing it and is over the moon to be a part of the Star Wars universe in context of something so brilliant like this. Um, I was just so ever so grateful. And that I think translates into what's on the page and what I tried to give, because as I think I'm just as grateful to be on this journey as Sig is to be on his. What was your experience like working with writers Dan and Benji and director Chris? Yeah, they're a really collaborative trio. I think what's so good is they complement each other so well. Um, uh, Dan's always really, really good um, with like giving you the world through his uh, his own performances with the other characters and stuff and helping you kind of get into a really great zone and safe space with that. Uh, super enthusiastic uh, when helping you and bouncing um, back and forth. I can imagine how exhausting that is doing that with every cast member that's there. And Benji has like this, there's like this like odd couple vibe of like, they completely complement each other in completely different ways where Benji will just like cut and be like, yeah, but let's keep this in mind and like centers things really, really well and has a really good relationship with understanding like the visual world that they're creating and giving you references as to what the environment might be like and, and how it is you might be able to bring something new out and like Tony was saying, that Chris is such a great macro sense of of the excitement of building this world, literally like, through like building blocks and Legos, building this world together, and um, uh, letting it all melt into one really cool project. And um, it's been really, really fun getting to know them really well. And I've never had a dynamic or relationship with writers of a show specifically in in. Dan and Benji's case of a rapport enough where I can text them and be like, what do you think of this? Or um, this is, I, I can, like, I remember, uh, I, I just never felt like comfortable enough to like make suggestions or like riff with the script. And they were always super excited about like the opportunity to improv some things in if like their other scene around that hadn't been recorded yet. And that's really rare. And even if these things don't make the cut, it, it makes like a really trusting it, it, it facilitates a really trusting environment and uh at least i can't speak for anybody else but that's something i've always really really respected about them and it made a really fun shoot all right what was your favorite character mashup in the special and that's for everyone i really did love i've said it before but i think that just even if it's as a bit the greedo han leia love triangle is really freaking funny i think that's just genius i think um I think Beach Bum Luke is just ridiculous as a concept and so funny. Um, like just this, yeah, you know, like this day drinking loser who just like gambles is it's hilarious. Like, and I'm I, I'm sure that Mark had a lot of fun playing it. I'm so excited to hear what he did with it. Um, I've heard like little snippets here and there, 
But uh, yeah, particularly I'm very excited to hear all of our voices paired up alongside Mark's, which is kind of bizarre to even conceive that that's going to happen. Marseille, describe your uh, Yessi. Sorry, I don't know how to pronounce that. Yessi Scala in her life when we first meet her and what happens yes. when she gets caught up and twisted in the version in the twisted version of the galaxy. Yes. Well, Yessi Scala is a pilot looking to leave the thing that she's known for so long, which is her home planet, uh, which is where her father is, a uh, farmer Scala. And that is where she finds these nerf herders on her father's farm. And really she at the, in the beginning she's very she's very guarded you know she's you know always on on 10 toes down making sure everything is good and then she gets caught up in this twisted insane version of the galaxy um and goes on this agrees to go on the super big adventure with Sig and Jedi Bob to try to restore the galaxy and in this in this world you see her you see her feeling all types of different emotions. You see her nervous. You see her excited. You see her just ready for the challenge that she's been looking for all her life. And, you know, throughout this time, you kind of just see her form into the leader that she hopes to be. So, All right. And uh, Gaten and Marseille, how did you approach voicing your characters and finding their personas? Want to go first, Marseille? Oh, yeah. Um... How did I find it? Well, I honestly, it was a, it was like a clean slate for me. It was a learning process that I was fully an open book for. Um, I know Yessie is a new character in this universe. So I wanted to talk to Dan and Benji like directly and see like how they were feeling and um, where they saw her character going and, and how she starts and, you know, where she ends up going. And that's really what I, what I thrive on is seeing really the, beginning and roughly what the end is going to turn out to be to see what that transition and that challenge is throughout you know even though it's voiceover you you want to you want to resonate that within the voice of your character and the passion that is behind it and that was that was pretty much it you know I always come into a different project with just an open book and talking to the creators of it all and being able to go back and forth and collab on it so um what I did know about Yessie was that she's a super confident ready for a challenge fast-paced girl and uh, that's all I need to know and we just went for it what was your experience like working with writers Dan and Benji and director Chris I'm a person that energy matches with energy so to have them really be excited for every episode coming into it. It made me even more excited because I'm like, okay, like I want to make them proud. I want to make them excited to to go back and mush all of the things that we created and putting it together. And um, yeah, I mean, obviously, I mean, the first the first time you go into a new project like this, um, it could feel a little nerve wracking or very intimidating to be like, right, I want to make sure my voice aligns with what they saw in the character and they just they just made it such a fun and collaborative and creative experience and they're so funny and they're exciting and they're they they are uh they make you feel very comfortable for sure so um I always I always knew I was safe and protected in this space to really just do what I had to do all right what was your favorite character mashup in the special that's what I love about all these. Like Dark Jar Jar is probably the the funniest one for me, but also too, um, it. I love when projects feel like fan fiction. Like yeah. you just never think they're gonna happen, but then <laughs> it just pops up out of nowhere. It's like, wait, this is a real thing. Like, wait, what? Yeah. So for that to be to be to be the case is gonna be very surprising and and exciting for viewers for sure. What can fans expect when they watch Lego Star Wars rebuild the galaxy? It's it's filled with adventure and mm -hmm. action, and there's always something going on. It's not one of them things that's like <laughs> a, a period of scenes that just uh -oh. are like like no. It's there's always something happening. Mm -hmm. Oh, which I believe people will find excitement in, and I am beyond grateful to be a part of a franchise that it's just it keeps the stakes get higher regardless if you're a Lego or in live action. So yeah. it's, it's really, really fun. Tell us about Dev and how his dynamic with his brother changes in the story. Uh, Dev is his cooler older brother. Uh, Dev <laughs> is his cooler older brother, um, who 
honestly is just wanting to change his life up. He wants to escape um, his small little town uh, and he's ready for big movements, big changes. And when he finds out his younger brother can use the force, he's the most excited about it more than anyone, more than Sig himself. More than Sig. Um, and when the cornerstone gets removed and the galaxy rearranges itself and he comes back as Darth Devastator, a Sith Lord who's forgotten all about his brother, um, he goes through a journey trying to capture Sig um, while Sig's, you know, trying to capture his brother back. And um, and it's a wonderful story uh, where he's got to change and figure out whether he wants Sig for the cornerstone or Sig as a brother. How did you approach voicing Deb and then his mashup, Darth Devastator? Um, yeah, I approached it trying to be as cool as I possibly could, um, which is not that cool, but, you know, I tried anyway. I don't uh, know, man. So hopefully, you know, they did make a really, really handsome minifig, so I'll, I'll <laughs> um, but, um, yeah, you know, Dev, Dev's just a cool older brother, and as someone who is, um, both a younger and older brother, um, I have a cool older brother that I love and and I like to think that I'm a cool older brother to my youngest. So, um, you know, I kind of just brought that to the table and then as for the development into um, Darth Devastator, I really kind of just went into it with Dan and Benji and Chris and kind of the team and, and we're taking it in strides and constantly making changes and, and arrangements um, because it, it was such a huge shift and change and it needed to constantly morph and it still did even after we did our initial scratch records we would come back and you know have different reads and different things or we wanted a little bit more emotional or maybe a little bit more angry on certain um, things and we're constantly shifting so I think it, it was a constant development I don't think I ever had one set plan um, and, and ne neither did they. And I think that collaboration really kind of developed uh, so that way we could just constantly find what needed to happen with um, with Darth Dev. All right, this next question is for everyone. Uh, what was your experience like working with writers Dan and Benji and director Chris? Uh, working with the IP whisperers, Dan Hernandez and Benji Samet were incredible um they are so much fun dan honestly was always you know there in the booth reading you know whether it be jedi bob's lines or sig's lines since obviously i didn't get a chance to work with all of this team together all in one go um he was able to read and you know certainly he gave it uh, 110 percent even on those reads and you know made me want to give so much more and whenever we were stuck with certain issues or lines weren't working or something just wasn't fitting Benji swooped in like the 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 hero he was with a great different line or whatever it might have been and that was awesome and and Chris was constantly figuring out which takes you know constantly going that one's going to match really well with getting this and that so I think he had an amazing macro view of what was happening um and taking that into consideration with everything else or you know being like you know Tony you're about to get slammed into a wall so like give me a hard hit and you know it was, it was great direction and honestly it was just a blast to work with them all right what was your favorite character mashup in the special uh darth jar jar to me is is just hilarious you know i was the guy on on those you know youtube videos and reddit forums uh-huh that was darth jar -Jar 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 -Jar. and i want it i want it i want it it's so oh, fun. and the fact that they were able to do it like honestly that's that's the funnest one for me. Um, and then um, Jedi Darth Vader, or Jedi mm -hmm. Vader, which I think is really funny because he still got burned. <laughs> <laughs> like, he did. He still, still, what happened? Happened. He still got burned. He still got burned. <laughs> He's still in the suit. He's still in the suit. Why? That's so funny. I never right? thought. Yeah. What can fans expect when they watch Lego Star Wars Rebuild the Galaxy? And that's for everyone as well. Fun. They can expect fun because we had fun doing it. They had fun writing it. Chris had fun directing it. So we hope and we know that the fans are just going to enjoy it. 
that they're going to find it so funny and hopefully have fun like we did. Uh, Bobby, uh, tell us as a Star Wars fan and a Lego collector, uh, what was it like to work on a project that combines those two interests and what was the most fun for you about that? Uh, as a fan of both Lego and Star Wars uh, growing up and as a full-blown adult, um, I, I, I I love the idea. Like the whole concept of this show is like mix everything up and play with it together. I, I love that. I've always loved that. I love when like you see, do you remember when like the Muppets would do Star Wars or like the Muppets yeah, did Treasure Island? Island. Like, I love the idea of cross genre um, <laughs> uh, cross genre um, IPs kind of getting together and, and just doing that. And also just, it, it's fun to see all of our favorite Star Wars characters in a brand new way. I would watch an entire series of, of Jedi Darth Vader. It's the coolest, like he's the best. <laughs> uh, he, he just, he's just misunderstood Darth. I don't want to be a Darth Vader apologist right now. So I'm going to stop my answer. <laughs> um, uh, what did you know about Jedi Bob uh, and his history in the play sets when you took on the role? Uh, I knew a lot about the history of Jedi Bob and kind of the play set uh, uh, when it when I before I got the role. Um, I had this because I'm the coolest adult in the world. I had this before you did. I'll tell you that. Um, uh, <laughs> Uh, I knew all about it. I, I like to collect things. And in the collector world, that was a fun story of just like this thing that they released that was kind of just to release something that the fans turned into now something I'm doing interviews about. And uh, it's, it's, it's pretty cool to see that to fruition from start to be uh, as being a fan of it. And now being able to say like, I'm Jedi Bob, I get to be, I'm that guy. I'm that guy that was just hanging around. And now he's part of it. It's kind of my whole career. Um, can you tell us about the origins of Jedi Bob's full name and how that might be a nod to Lego? Yes, I can tell you about the origins of Jedi Bob's full name for one trillion dollars. Um, the, the origins of Jedi Bob's name, Jedi, his full name, if you were to refer to him as he as requested, would be Jedi Master Barbarian Afol. Not so hard, but the, a pretty Star Warsy name, a pretty cool Star Warsy name. Jedi Master Barbarian Afol, Afol, A F O L, uh, standing for uh, adult fan of Legos, which is uh, uh, or adult fan of Lego. Pardon, sweet Jeebus, I I almost messed up. Uh, there's no S in Lego, none. There never will be. Um, Jedi Bob is a popular Lego playset figurine. Um, how did you approach realizing and bringing him to life for this animated special as a being? Um, I talked, I, when I was cast as Jedi Bob, I got to talk to Dan and Benji, uh, uh, the creators of this series, uh, all about, you know, building this character and kind of what they saw for it and what I saw for it. And what we ended up on, or at least what I ended up on in my mind is sort of a mix between Obi-Wan Kenobi and Qui-Gon Jinn, if they were um, Danny Glover from Lethal Weapon. Like they, and I, I think I very much improvised, I'm getting too old for this ship, uh, S-H-I-P, uh, every single time I was on a Star Wars ship. Uh, uh, and I, I don't think it made it. <laughs> Uh, but that was my, I was just trying, a, a, a Jedi who tries really hard to sound like a Jedi, that's, but isn't great at it. That's what I tried to do. So, um, <laughs> so what is Jedi Bob up to in this show? And uh, can you talk about his relationship with Sig? Uh, what is Jedi Bob up to in this series? I'm guessing about an inch, an inch and a half, probably. Uh, but for a real answer, um, uh, Jedi Bob is up to what he does best, saving um, galaxies and rebuilding them from the start. Um, no, uh, his, he's, he's being 
Jedi Bob's journey is kind of becoming what he never wanted to be, which is responsible <laughs> for, for, for another person. He was, he has some trauma in the past, uh, uh, what happened to him to become a Jedi. So the last thing he wants to do is pass that on to Sig, who is this kind of kid who he maybe sees some of himself in, who's gotten himself into this predicament and is trying to just do his best, kind of like Jedi Bob. So maybe that, that bit of Jedi Bob, the dad in him, or the, the, the father figure or the the padawan to uh what, what do you what would you call the i mean to guess master master yeah thank you what other characters does jedi bob have the most interaction with the most interaction with okay and uh is he affected by the galactic mix-up thank you um Jedi Bob has interaction the most with, I would say, you know, Sig and uh, uh, Servo, his, dro his droid, uh, gets on his nerves a lot. And uh, well, everyone gets on Jedi Bob's nerves at some point. Um, but yeah, kind of that core crew, uh, uh, Yessi and everybody, they're, they're on the mission to, to, to go rebuild the galaxy. Uh, I get to do a, a lot of stuff with with them, I get to do a little bit with Mark Hamill and as as Beach Luke and and Ahmed Best as Darth Jar Jar. Uh, it's the best. Uh, yeah, like if yeah, fight Dar Jar Darth Jar Jar in a Lego movie if you can. It's really fun. Um. Uh. What's your favorite character mashup in the whole special? Um. My favorite character mashup in the whole special. Gosh, it changes minute to minute. It was Beach Luke. It still is Beach Luke. It's all. It will always be Beach Luke. But I'm going to tell you more anyway. Um, I just love that Mark Hamill is so funny in this role. He's so good. Uh, Ahmed Best coming back to do Darth Jar Jar is, is absolutely amazing. Um, I personally really like some of the side little side guys. Like we got a little Darth Nubs in the background. And... Uh, um, <laughs> um uh the way that darth maul is is in this mixed up world he is not just an evil sisyphus he is <laughs> like just a gentleman and i just really enjoy that uh gosh there's so many i i i, I truly love them all i also can't wait to see it again because i'm gonna watch it a thousand times so this ask ask me this again in two weeks thank you uh, last one. Uh, what do you hope fans get out of Lego Star Wars Rebuild the Galaxy? Uh, what do I hope Lego fans uh, and Star Wars fans get out of this show, Rebuild the Galaxy? Joy. I hope they get the joy that they got when they play with Lego or when they watch Star Wars. And I hope that it's doubled on top of itself because of the combination of the two. It's like having ice cream and a milkshake. Well, I guess that's the same thing. It's kind of like having um, a birthday cake and, no, that's not, or a pie on a birth. It's a pie on a birthday cake. All right, first question. How did the idea for Lego Star Wars Rebuild the Galaxy originate? So, yeah, so this sort of came about. Um, we've been talking to... Lucasfilm and Lego for a little while. We helped out with the uh, we did some punch up jokes for the original Lego holiday special. And so we had an open line of communication with them and and then it was approaching, you know, this year is the 25th anniversary of the Lego Star Wars partnership, which is such an iconic brand partnership. And they wanted to do something big and special to celebrate that. And so we started talking about how how can we celebrate all things Lego Star Wars? And well, what we all quickly came to was this idea of, well, let's really, let's try recreating that feeling that you get from playing with your Star Wars Lego, like, like the way a kid or an adult, honestly, uh, plays with Star Wars Lego is they take their bin of Lego and they dump it on the ground and it's pieces everywhere and you don't follow the story exactly as as it is uh, in the script. You start to make it your own galaxy. You rebuild things. You you mix up ships. You mix up characters. You you make your own story. 
And so that was the jumping off point for us to to make our own story in, in the Lego Star Wars universe. Great. Okay. Number two. You are both Star Wars fans. So what did it mean to you to get a chance to work on this with with Lucasfilm? I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that it's the realization of a lifelong dream, but a dream that felt impossible, a dream that felt like it was for other people. And suddenly we found ourselves realizing everything that we had always wanted to accomplish in our career, which was telling a true Star Wars story. And yes, it's Lego Star Wars. And that means that there's a certain tone comedically and that we can poke a little bit of fun at ourselves. But it was very important to both of us to say, but it only is going to be meaningful if the story that we're telling has a point. And if it feels like all of the Star Wars stories that we love, that it has those classic moments of talking about the nature of the force, the dark side and the light, a protagonist who finds his strength in an unexpected way, an unlikely cast of characters who who lend a hand and a fight worth having to save the galaxy. And so that to us was the most rewarding part is to really feel like we got to tell the story that we wanted to tell and that it's spiritually aligned with with all the things that has have inspired us uh over the years great okay what are some of the core star wars themes that we may see in this animated special we tried to throw a little bit of everything in there you know we we're we're big fans of everything Star Wars, everything Lego Star Wars. And uh, so, you know, whether it's original trilogy, prequels, sequels, the TV shows, the, every animated stuff, we wanted this to be, you know, as I said, like a, a, a true celebration of all things Lego Star Wars. So, you know, there's definitely a little bit of everything that you know and love in there with uh, plenty of surprises too. I think that when you're talking about Star Wars, you you need to kind of understand what is powerful about it. And to me, what has always been powerful about it is this idea of in, the interconnectivity of all life and all people and things. The force is really where everything for me begins with Star Wars and how you think about telling a Star Wars story. And, and outcropping from that is the light side and the dark side and our own kind of decision making based around which way are we going to go in our own lives everyone has the capacity for both one path is easier it's seductive it seems to give you everything that you want and the other is more difficult it's more subtle and it doesn't necessarily tell you what to do or how to do it you kind of have to follow as we say in the special the, the whisper in the back of your mind and that was a very important thing to carry through. And I think that that really informs everything about some of the other classic themes that you're going to see. People that you wouldn't expect to, to come through find heroism within themselves. People that could have been great heroes falling into darkness because of their own pain or desire or the insecurities that rest within them. And really exploring all of those classic Star Wars dilemmas, uh, but while still doing it with humor and and in this sort of unexpected delivery system, but all of those classic things are still embedded firmly in the in the heart of this of this special. Cool. All right. How did you come up with the galactic shakeup idea and how did you approach putting it on the page? So that was something that we very early on in conversation with Lego and Lucasfilm came to together that we said, why don't we try to do something completely different than anything that has been attempted in Lego Star Wars or even really in, in 
sort of the the core Star Wars lines and and reimagining what some of these characters are like. Bad guys are good guys. Good guys are bad guys. Planets are different. Ships are different. Um, so that that idea came very early. But what was more challenging was how to actually articulate that idea on the page and even more than on the page, visually. So the sequence where the galaxy is actually rebuilt in the first episode after Sig removes the cornerstone from its resting place was the sequence that probably took the most time in the entire special because it had to be exactly right. Everything else in the special was resting on this very big sequence that sort of was unprecedented in the history of Star Wars. There really isn't anything exactly equivalent to it. And so it was a process of writing and rewriting and iterating visually. And when we finally locked in on Jedi Bob's narration over that scene, which Bobby Moynihan, I have to say, absolutely just crushes. He he does such an amazing job of delivering this information that is critical for everyone watching the show, but it's really emotional. It, it gives me goosebumps every time I watch it because his performance is so filled with emotion and it's so moving and it's playing on all the things that we know about our proper Star Wars galaxy and suddenly we're somewhere else completely. So, so that sequence in particular was the most poured over, not only by us, but by Chris Buckley, our incredible director, by the team at Atomic Cartoons, by Lego itself. Everyone really had to pull together and figure out how to articulate the sequence so that the rest of the specials could could soar because it needed this foundation to 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 ground it and to and to really explain to everyone what we're doing differently than anything that you've seen before. What were the challenges with the world building a mixed up galaxy? What did you want to convey with the characters, even though they were not themselves in that world? I would say the biggest challenge in in creating the the mixed up galaxy was uh, finding that balance between what is you know we it needed to be weird and different and mixed up and confusing for Sig, who is an expert in the Star Wars galaxy that that we all know and love. Uh, it needed to feel substantially different to him and and surprising. But at the same time, the other side of that coin is that it needed to still feel like Star Wars. And so, you know, that was sort of the, the tightrope we were walking was keep keeping it weird and, and twisted and off, but also keeping it very much feeling like we are in the Star Wars galaxy. We are in, you know, a Star Wars story, just a different version of it. And I think part of the way that I think we accomplished that was by having great intention behind every decision that was made as far as the mashups, how they were mashed up. We really tried to have a reason for every single change that was historic to this version of the galaxy, that it wasn't just arbitrary. It wasn't just done as a bit or because it looked funny, but that there were in fact in story reasons that the galaxy's history has unfurled the way that it has. And so I think even if, the audience watching doesn't necessarily have those answers. I think subconsciously it feels like the creators or the people making the show have those answers and it makes it feel a more lived in version of this galaxy, even though it's something that we haven't seen before, but it feels like everything is kind of functioning in, in harmony with itself. Hey, Give us some ideas of the galactic shakeups we will see in the show and why it was so fun to create them. So, I mean, we one of the most fun parts of, of being able to shake up the galaxy was just getting to play with, with pet theories of ours, not just, you know, theories that lots of people have, like Darth Jar Jar, which was fun and exciting to, to explore that, but, like, there are things like, you know... We've always talked about what would Ewok bounty hunters look like. Even before we were working on this, that was just like uh, something like we we went to college together and we would just hang out and talk about Star Wars way back then. Because we were cool. Because, yeah, we were so cool. And, uh, you know, I think that was something that Dan brought up w one night when we were just like hanging out in college. Just like, what if what if there was like a band of Ewoks that got some 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 old like imperial tech and became bounty hunters um and so then fast forward 20 years later 
and we're working on this and it's like what about that old ewok bounty hunter idea you had um uh, other things well for me it was saying okay you know one of the jokes is you kind of always end up on Tatooine and we knew that we were going to end up on Tatooine because it is so iconic, but we said, well, what's a different version of Tatooine? What would be a dynamic version of Tatooine that really spoke to the changes in this galaxy? And then we said, well, you know, what if it was a water planet and what if they did water pod racing? And the second that we came up with that idea, we said, oh, well, Luke needs to be the jock of this planet who never left and is just water pod racing and kind of using the force and maybe not the most scrupulous ways to to win races and and that really informed a huge part of the special because it was really environmentally built because so often you know i, I think one of the things that star wars does exceptionally well is really giving you a sense of how the planets and the environments and the atmosphere inform the civilizations on those planets, the aliens on those planets, their attitudes towards things. And so when we knew that we were going to mash things up, we also knew that we then had to build those cultures from the ground up. The same thing with uh, Finessa, the nerf herding planet. This is the first time that we've seen nerf herding actually on screen in any Star Wars content. So that was also amazing because it said it, it required us to say, okay, what is a nerf herding planet? What do they do on this planet? What, what environmental problems do they encounter which is where the ion storm came from and the second that we had the idea for the ion storm that dictated uh the kind of electromagnetic uh shepherd stick and that becomes a huge story thing later and so all of these things really were built organically from the ground up and then so oftentimes we go oh this thing that we kind of built actually connects perfectly over here and i think again that's part of this wanting this feeling of wanting it to feel lived in and and sort of uh, a unified thought of what this new galaxy is. Tell us more about the incredible voice cast and what it was like recording with legends like Mark Hamill. It, I mean, it was a dream come true. It was, I mean, it literally was a dream come true. You can't hope in your wildest imagination that someday that you would write lines for Luke Skywalker and that Mark Hamill would read your script and say, you know, I want to do this because I think you guys really understand Star Wars, which is what he said to us. And it was the highest compliment we've ever been paid in our career. So to work with Mark, who of course is Luke Skywalker, but also is, if not the greatest voice actor of all time, certainly on the Mount Rushmore of the greats, um, it was a dream come true. And then you go to Ahmed, who you know, uh, his performance as Dark Jar Jar is 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 so shocking and and amazingly funny and and sort of malign and all the things that you want an evil version of Jar Jar to be, and he is that character, and that extends to all of the legacy characters, Anthony Daniels as C three PO. I mean, who? What can you possibly tell Anthony Daniels about three PO? He knows it all. He is three PO, and so oftentimes he would say, oh, what if I said it like this? Or I think maybe three people might do this. And we go, of course, oh my gosh, yes. Kelly Marie Tran, uh, Naomi Aki, you know, all, all of all of the people that that came back. And then we had- and then, Yeah, on the, on the other side of things, uh, there's all of our original new characters, which the cast is incredible. You know, uh, Gaten and Tony and and Marseille and, and Bobby and, and Michael Cusack, like just every single one of them is like, a plus voice actor, actor, uh, great people that were so excited to be a part of this, and 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 big Star Wars fans, huge. which which also was a huge thing because they would make suggestions or they'd say, hey, what if I tried it like this? Or they would say, you know, Bobby and Michael Cusack are unbelievable improvisers, and so they would start improvising things that we never could have conceptualized on the page, and then you'd go, well. That's better than what I wrote. So I guess that's what we're doing. Um, and down the line, it just, and, you know, and that also extends to the, to the, the who's who of, of uh, voice talent from the other Star Wars animated content and other, you know, like people like Phil Lamar, who is a legend in his own right. Um, Kevin Michael Richardson, you know, all of these people are Shelby Young, you know, just the best of the best of the best. And so it really felt like we were putting together 
our own special ensemble, like an all-star team, I've, I've, I've called it. And that's how it felt in the moment. What can viewers expect when they watch Lego Star Wars Rebuild the Galaxy? It may sound too simplistic, but I think they can expect to have an amazing time. It is a purely fun experience that I think anyone at any age and any level of fandom can appreciate, whether that's someone who has never watched any Star Wars content before, like my kids who are young, or some people like us who are versed and studied and sort of professors of Star Wars lore. I think that there's something for everyone. But the main headline was we said, this has got to feel like a classic, fun Star Wars story, and it's got to get the Lego right. It's got to be true to what Lego Star Wars is. We have to see builds that we've never seen before, and we have to honor the spirit of this partnership that, you know, at year 25 is is just really a special, a, just a really special thing. And so I think the main thing you can expect is to be delighted and to be surprised and to see things that you never thought that you'd see in Star Wars content.